morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us both in person and online for the second day of our Giving Voice Symposium. Uh, I'm Rachel D'Agostino. I'm the curator of printed books here at the Library Company of Philadelphia and co-curator of the exhibition, Hearing Voices, Memoirs from the Margins of Mental Health, along with co-curator, Sophia Dahab. Um, you will hear from Sophia in a few moments. And um, so I'm just here to say hi, welcome you to our day of learning about the 19th, 20th, and 21st century, uh, some issues in mental health treatment, and seeing if we can find a way to learn from each other as we move forward. Uh, the, um, the, the symposium is part of our Hearing Voices exhibition, which was developed um, thanks in large part to Charles Rosenberg, medical historian and great supporter of the library company, who back in about 2012 donated to the institution a large number of what are colloquially referred to as insanity narratives. These are stories that are uh, printed and published um, and tell the tale of an individual's experience either with mental illness or with treatment for mental illness, sometimes in the uh, total absence of any illness. And um, so we, we were very fortunate to be able to receive this clutch of materials. And honestly, as soon as we did, the need to share them with you all became apparent because they, they tell the story from a different angle, of course. And, um, and they tell the story of their experience at a moment in time where the United States and other countries, um, notably France and England, uh, were really experimenting with a new approach to mental health treatment called moral treatment. And that approach really mirrors in many ways what a lot of people would like to see uh, effected today in, in hopes to provide better treatment for people who, who need that help. Um, but as Stephen Freed mentioned last night, uh, changes and developments in mental health treatment are not, as he said, linear. So we, we often have this idea when we think about the past that we've been steadily making progress and making positive change, when in fact that is, that is not the case. And so it really helps to explore what went wrong in the past, why a really good idea might not have been effectively implemented or might not have lasted. Um, something else Stephen said last night in his really wonderful keynote, which by the way, all of these sessions are being recorded. So if you missed it, you must check it out. Um, he, he spoke about, um, I'm sorry, I completely lost my train of thought. <laughs> sorry, um, the, the coffee has not smoothed the molasses in my brain sufficiently to get it moving quickly. Um, but so, when we think about making progress and looking back on what might have failed, um, we need to understand that the people who were implementing these changes, um, by and large, had very good motives, right? Um, so it's wrong to look back and say that because a person's experience in an asylum might have been incredibly negative, that the people who set up that system had nefarious motives or were motivated by greed, um, the, the, the intentions were by and large quite positive. So we must understand uh, where things went wrong. And, and as, I, as I said, um, what the, the basis of moral treatment was very similar to what we would like to see implemented today. Um, and that really brings um, into light how important it is for us to look at that history and to relay that history to current practitioners. There's no point in doing the work that we do here at the library company if our examination of history stays just within our relatively small group of historians, right? We need to find more and more ways to try and move that conversation, uh, move our discoveries into the current uh, conversation um, 
And, and so we decided as part of hearing voices that we would create this symposium as a way to try to create some dialogue between people who study the past and people who are implementing actions on the ground today in attempts to help folks who, um, who need that assistance. Uh, the exhibition is very historically focused. It is made with materials from our own collections here at the library company, as well as loans from a number of really wonderful area institutions, as well as some individual um, owners of materials. Uh, there's a lot to see there. The physical exhibition will be coming down on December 22nd. It's been up since May, but it will live on indefinitely online with all of the content that is in the online, the physical exhibition um, mirrored online. So please do take a look at that if you have not yet had a chance to do so. Um, and I say that again to historians as well as to current practitioners and community members, because we really can learn a lot um, from looking at, at what happened in the past, the successes and the failures. Um, so I am going to leave my comments there and I'm going to turn over the mic to my colleague, Sophia Dahab. Good morning. Thank you all for joining us today. Um, I would like to start by offering some thank yous to some very important people. Um, this symposium would not have been possible without the untiring efforts and support of our colleagues here at the library company, especially Alison Gronstad, Dana Dorman, Fran Dolan, Katie Maxwell, Dan Scheiman, Angela Paceres. We also need to thank some, some recent staff members as well, uh, Blanche Brown, Rachel Hammer, and Carlton Goals. We'd also like to thank Stephen Feitzman, Charles Rosenberg, uh, a thousand times, Mariah Thompson, Abraham Gutman, and Stacey Peoples. Finally, we would like to thank the Sozo Se Foundation for helping us turn our grand vision for this symposium into a reality. Um, a couple of housekeeping things this morning before we get started. Um, this event is hybrid, uh, so we are joined by a virtual audience as well. Hybrid events, as many of you know, I'm sure you know, uh, are hard and very complicated. So please be patient with us. Um, if we experience any technology hiccups, I'm sure we will at some point today. Um, also, as Rachel said, this symposium is being recorded. Um, so those recordings will be made available to you after. Um, we do hope that you check out the exhibition um, in, the, in the gallery out there. I do have to remind you that we do not allow food and drink in that room. Um, so please, during our breaks, take your refreshments in the Logan room, um, but do not take them into the gallery. Um, we are going to be talking about some difficult things today. And I must also mention that some of our speakers are going to be using language that is for good reason, no longer used today, but is important in its historical context. And some of what we talk about could be triggering. Uh, with that, I would like to introduce our first speaker this morning, uh, Liana Glue, who will be talking about Memoirs of Madness, Asylum Reform and Patient Memoirists in the 19th Century. Liana Glue is the Prison Education Program Manager at Penn State University's Restorative Justice Initiative. Her academic training is in American literature and her research on disability studies and psychiatric history focuses mainly on the late 19th and early 20th centuries. She is specifically interested in the many genres of text that came out of psychiatric institutions at the time, including paperwork, memoirs, and archival patient writing. She is the winner of the 2021 History of the Human Sciences Early Career Prize, and her writing can be found in J19 and the forthcoming edited collection, Cripping the Archive. Motivated by this research, she now works in the field of restorative justice and prison education. As the largest psychiatric treatment facility in the US is currently a county jail, she sees this work as a direct intervention into the legacy of psychiatric institutions. Um, we have some large print copies of Liana's talk available. If you would like a copy, please just let me know. Liana? Yeah. Great, thank you so much, Sophia. And thank you to uh, all of the folks at the library company who made this possible. Um, really grateful to have been invited and to be talking to you all today. Uh, so as Sophia said, um, speaking of hearing voices, I know mine is not the loudest. So if you would like that large print access copy to read along with me, you're more than welcome. Just uh, raise your hand and come pass that out. Uh, so I am, I'll, I'll give it a second for the, 
the PowerPoint to come up. But as I do, I'll, I'll also note that I'm, I'm really excited to be giving this talk today here because many of the texts that I'll be talking about are right outside. So I'm hoping that um, on our break, that will give some context, some uh, more fruitful ways of thinking about what's right in that other room today. All right, so uh, <laughs> I'll give it a second again for the, uh, the PowerPoint. Oh, fabulous. Okay. So uh, the talk today is called Memoirs of Madness, Asylum Reforms, and Patient Memoirists in the 19th Century. When Sylvia Plath brought the manuscript for what would become the Bell Jar to Harper and Row in the early 1960s, the publishing house rejected it, saying it was, quote, yet another madness narrative entering an already crowded field. It's true that the genre was truly sprawling in the U.S. by the mid-20th century, but the roots of the genre run deep, and to understand the genesis, the historical importance, and the legacy of asylum memoirs, we have to return to the 19th century. Uh, and I'll, I'll gesture to Alison for the second slide. Um, so last week I saw a talk by education researcher Naila Suad Nasir, who said, and I'm paraphrasing here, I jotted it down on a hotel napkin, so forgive me, um, that research means learning about the world around you and working to make it better. I'm really gratified to see the structure of today's symposium reflects that. Um, and I'd also like to reflect that in my own talk because very often when we talk about narrative and archival research, and it's true that this, this research began in an English department, um, that, that second half gets lost, that working to make it better. So uh, I'm going to make some of those connections at the very end to the current work that I'm doing as a type of practitioner. So I'll begin our time, oh, sorry, new slide. I'll begin our time today by talking, uh, by exploring those questions about the roots of the genre of asylum memoirs, as well as how the genre influenced and was influenced by late 19th century asylum reform. Then I'll turn to my own interpretation of the genre, highlighting in particular how these authors worked in conversation with what we would now call disability studies to reshape the public perceptions of madness. And finally, I'll use my concluding remarks uh, to move us into the present and comment on what I see as a legacy of asylum memoirs. It's here that I'll also explain how I see this archival research informing my day job working with currently incarcerated learners. Before jumping into my talk about genre, I wanted to make a brief note about my language choices in this talk. Uh, so I purposefully use terms that have, for many good reasons, fallen out of our professional lexicons. So for example, madness and insanity, were and still are sometimes uh, largely harmful terms that caught many types of perceived deviance in their nets. Um, by the middle of the 19th century, practitioners had moved away from using these terms like madness and insanity and even asylum and replaced them with more medicalized terms. But it's for this reason that I find it really interesting that the patient writers I'll be talking about today chose to still use those more stigmatized terms like madness, insanity, asylum. Um, and they evoked this violent cultural history for a reason. Um, so for me to replace madness with mental illness or asylum with psychiatric institution in this particular context would change the patient writer's meaning. So as I discuss each memoir, I'll do my best to mirror the terms that the author chose, but I just wanted to give the rationale behind that choice because I know sometimes that language can be jarring. New slide. So I've highlighted a few significant asylum memoirs here, three of which are right outside in the other room. Um, Isaac Hunt's 1851 Astounding Disclosures, Three Years in a Madhouse, Elizabeth Parsons Ware Packard's 1871 The Prisoner's Hidden Life or Insane Asylums Unveiled, Nellie Bly's 1887 Ten Days in a Madhouse, and Clifford Beer's 1908 A Mind That Found Itself. It's important to note that of these four, only Hunt and Beers, the first and the fourth, ever laid claim to having experienced madness themselves. Packard, the second one, uh, claims that her husband wrongfully incarcerated her, and Bly was an undercover journalist. So additionally, these memoirs were published within approximately 50 years of each other. While madness memoirs certainly existed before and after those 50 years, and there are some out there from, I think, as early as 1830, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, there was this flare of asylum-specific madness memoirs in the second half of the 19th century. And I think that flare-up can tell us quite a bit about the history of these institutions during those 50 years. New slide. So beyond published memoirs, I'll also highlight a couple patient-authored newsletters, including the OPAL of the Utica 
Lunatic Asylum in New York, which is also right out there. I swear I didn't do this totally on purpose. These are just the texts I like to talk about and they happen to be here. <laughs> and the meteor out of the Alabama Insane Hospital to broaden the scope from just patients who had the access and ability to write and publish a full memoir. I've also included an image here all the way uh, to the, the far side of um, a, a patient file, something I found in a patient file in the Oregon State Archive. It's from a patient authored newsletter, just like these first two, uh, from the early 20th century, but it was never published and it was never distributed. The patient hand wrote two editions of this newsletter that she titled Ravings. It's very funny, it's very quirky and uh, just really fantastic read. Um, but I, I don't have quite enough time to discuss all of the archival material in this talk, so I thought it was just important to flag it and demonstrate that not all patient writers had access to print publication. Um, and I would be happy to discuss uh, more of the patient writing that I found in these, these uh, patient folders in the Q&A. New slide. So uh, the 50 year period in which asylum memoirs were massively popular, so we're talking about the second half of the 19th century, occurred during a significant era in the history of mental health. And Stephen Fried flagged a lot of this for us last night. I'll go a little more in depth here just to give us uh, some foundations uh, for, for the rest of today's talk. So uh, activist Dorothea Dix and physician architect Thomas Story Kirkbride worked to establish psychiatric treatment facilities that would offer alternatives to almshouses and jails for people experiencing what they would have called insanity. Beyond simply establishing these facilities, they attempted to distance modern psychiatric treatment from the nightmarish images of places like Bedlam by designing total institutions in which patients would enjoy leisure activities, access to beautifully maintained grounds, freedom from restraints, and other liberties that were included in what they called moral treatment. So here on uh, my right, maybe your left, is a, a Kirkbride plan, which is his architectural plan for the hospital. There's also one right outside in that room. Again, I swear I didn't do that on purpose. <laughs> um, these long, narrow wings are shaped like that because his, uh, his design was to let the maximum amount of sunlight into every bedroom. Uh, you'll also see some uh, open space between the two wings. Uh, those are what he called airing courts where patients would spend time outside. And in the center administrative building, there were uh, a number of leisure activities like billiards rooms or uh, the sort of billiard tables, pianos, um, stages, dance halls, et cetera. So the nature of asylum visiting also changed to reflect these new values. Previously, the idea of asylum visiting recalled accounts of the hordes of paying visitors to Bedlam, eager to hear rattling chains and pained wails. Now the public was encouraged to focus on the immaculate grounds and modern facilities rather than on the patients themselves. And this is something we heard Stephen Fried talk about yesterday as well. He talked about how uh, this was an idea Rush had at the end of the 19th, at the end of the 18th century. Um, but after his death, uh, these hospitals reverted to uh, letting visitors pay to come see patients. Um, so this was something in the, the 1850s that changed again. Visitors could still pay to come to the hospital, but very often they were directed to look at the grounds, the modern treatment facilities, anything other than the patients themselves. As a patient editor of the Alabama Insane Hospitals newsletter, The Meteor, put it in 1872, visitors were now encouraged to inspect the workings of the institution and cultivate a quote, regard for the feelings of our afflicted ones, rather than gawking at patients as if they were part of a menagerie. With this shift, asylum tours began, became a way for administrators to gain public approval by showing off their humane facilities and participation in modern scientific progress. It is this shift, I'll argue, that made asylum memoirs so popular and so necessary. While it was progressive and humanizing to bar visitors from gawking at the patients, it also meant that patients often went unseen and unheard. And this was particularly important for poor patients and patients with disabilities who were often kept in back wards and basements without light. Um, and so again, it's this sort of uh, invisibility that was, uh, uh, that kind of came down in the 1850s. So asylum memoirs became the primary mode for patients to speak to the public. New slide. The public, however, had some growing pains with this shift. In an 1852 letter to the Opal, a, the patient authored newsletter uh, at Utica Lunatic Asylum, a young woman visitor tells the editor, who was a patient himself, that she had taken a merry sleigh ride with her friends and family to tour the asylum and be entertained by some sensational spectacle. Her hopes were dashed. 
In her letters, she complains that the place was clean as can be and that, quote, for all we could see, the patients look and act like other people. She had asked the party's reluctant guide if they could see something that might satisfy her curiosity. His response was to turn the party away from the hospital. The editor replied to this disappointed visitor and others like her that she was looking for a spectacle in all the wrong places. He wrote, could she see the heart aching with grief, which will not and cannot be comforted or withered by a long and solitary indulgence in thoughts of the neglect or scorn of the world, which whether real or imaginary cannot be removed by the sympathizing tones nor cheering smiles or that love which always soothes and animates a mind in trouble or torn and racked by passions which are always contending with each other and having no reality for their object may never give any outward manifestation of the agonizing tumult which reigns within. The editor tells us that the most striking part of asylum life is patients' inner worlds, the fluctuations of deeply human emotions that would be invisible to this visitor's gaze. Further, he asks just what would satisfy her desire to see something, violent behavior, emotional outbursts, and insists that though patients have behavioral idiosyncrasies, none would offer the kind of show this visitor seemed to desire. <laughs> Asylum memoirists played with the public's desire for a spectacle. Many of these authors set out to document their experiences of abuse in the hospital in order to inspire readers to advocate for material reforms in psychiatric treatment. To capture the public's attention and make these changes, patient writers had to grapple with a few questions. New slide. How do you narrate the experience of madness, if at all? How will stigma and suspicion influence the public's reception of the work? How can you capture the public's attention without dehumanizing patients by making a spectacle out of madness? A few emergent conventions within the genre of asylum memoirs helped guide the rhetorical goals of the genre, which took on a dual role of an institutional expose. To the first question, unlike the reporter authors of, of typical exposés, these memoirists are not simply concerned with narrating what they experienced, but also intent on conveying how they experienced it. For authors like Isaac Hunt, who I will discuss uh, in more detail in a moment, this meant experimenting with literary conventions to demonstrate how madness affected his experience of the hospital. To the second question, uh, there's a particular emphasis on backing up their claims with documents, witnesses, or letters. Uh, and this is to counter the assumption and stigma that uh, they're you know, mad and unreliable narrators. So Elizabeth Parsons Ware Packard begins her 1871 asylum memoir, The Prisoner's Hidden Life, by asserting that the text is an account of her emotional experience of forced incarceration and is not meant to be a quote, recital of physical abuses she witnessed. Despite this focus on her emotional world, Packard still demonstrates a desire to prove her sanity and supplies witness statements, documentation, and journals to support her claims. Some of these authors like Packard or Nellie Bly, um, the journalist who went undercover at New York's Blackwell's Asylum, Insane Asylum to write her 1887, 10 Days in a Madhouse, were met with legislative and financial success. Others have since fallen into obscurity. New slide. One of these authors who has largely fallen into obscurity with the exception of the fact that his memoir is right out there uh, is Isaac Hunt. Hunt provides us with an early case of how an author's experience with madness affected the composition and reception of his asylum memoir. In his 1851 memoir expose, Astounding Disclosures, Three Years in a Madhouse, Hunt admits to the reader that when his family brought him to the asylum against his will, he was indeed, in his words, a raving madman. Anticipating that this fact might immediately dash his credibility, Hunt begins with an imperative. Start not, think not that a madman raves. I shall utter not but the truth, truth so strong and reason so palpable that nothing short of sheer innate madness or stupidity of your own shall close your eye or ear to the cogent force and ends I have in view. He repeats these assertions of sanity throughout the text as he narrates his three long years of forced incarceration at the main insane hospital. Hunt's story begins with an admission to his admission to the asylum, details his experiences of abuse at the hands of Superintendent Isaac Ray, and ends with his release. However, Hunt's memoir also breaks with narrative conventions, like continuity and denouement. The story takes up less than 20% of the text. It's frequently interrupted by asides, and he quickly glosses over some seemingly important incidents, like how he secured his freedom. Astounding Disclosures also details some particularly extreme episodes from Hunt's time in the hospital that indicate how madness might have affected his experience. 
including a period in which he believed that hospital administrators were cooking his son's flesh and feeding it to him at dinner. He calls these episodes delusions, but he nevertheless believes that the hospital administrators deliberately planted these ideas in order to make him seem more insane. Thus, it's not always clear what Hunt believes really happened, what he believes he was made to think, and what was an effect of his mental state. After his narrative of incarceration, Hunt's text becomes a polemic made up of testimonials to his sanity, letters to various officials arguing for the removal of Dr. Ray, a narrative tour of the asylum grounds, which includes uh, virtual introductions to patients, and coverage of a fire that broke out in the hospital after Hunt's time there. One key to understanding how Hunt's project fits into this historical moment, the second half of the 19th century, may be found in his narrative tour around the asylum. It's here that Hunt explicitly offers the type of experience that a visitor would not now find on a newly reformed asylum tour. This section highlights the places that visitors are not usually shown. The lodge where a patient burned to death, what he calls a maniac prayer meeting, and particularly neglected wards. He further extends his invitation into the invisible parts of the asylum by providing short portraits of patients' interior lives. Do you see that man? Hunt asks the reader each time before describing how a patient's madness manifests physically. He describes behavioral wildness, unusual gaits, personality quirks, and directly follows his descriptions with an account of that patient's talents. Quote, he is a naturally a very smart, active man, or he has been a celebrated physician, or he is docile as a lamb unless under great provocation. Hunt acknowledges that the type of visual strangeness, like the visitors from the Opal's letter, um, might have wanted to see, but then he invites them to see the patient beyond his outward appearance, no doubt in an effort to foster recognition, admiration, and empathy. In scenes like this, memoir exposés produce this generative tension between insider and outsider, writer and reader. The tension exposes the assumptions that readers and asylum visitors might have about the storytellers they encounter. Disability scholars have written at length about the encounters between non-disabled and disabled people. And here I'm personally, um, purposefully using disability first language. From the anxiety produced by what Irving Goffman calls a mixed contact to the way that freak shows reaffirm spectators' positions as normal. New slide. One particularly helpful text in understanding this, this relationship between insider and outsider comes from Rosemary Garland Thompson's 2009 Staring How We Look. She examines the encounter between a starer and a starey, the person being stared at. So as is the case on an asylum tour, the person being stared at is often a disabled person or a person with an otherwise non-normative embodiment. Garland Thompson acknowledges that in many of these encounters, particularly those in a clinical or medical setting, the starey, the person being stared at, is objectified, made into an object of knowledge in the starer's quest to make sense of the unexpected. Far from being wholly objectifying, however, Garland Thompson argues that the staring encounter can also generate wonder, recognition, familiarity, and an opportunity for the starey to respond. This is the case when Isaac Hunt redirects the reader's stare away from patients' unusual appearance and towards their valuable interior qualities. In this way, Hunt uses his written narrative to replicate the aspects of an asylum tour that might be generative while mitigating the ways that visitors' stares might objectify patients. New slide. So Isaac Hunt's text is important rhetorical work. It's also important to note that there's no lifetime movie about his memoir expose as there is for Nellie Bly. His name has been largely forgotten. And when it is remembered, it's with the reminder that his sanity and thus his reliability should be questioned. Hunt self-published astounding disclosures in the middle of a legal battle against Superintendent Ray. His claims of abuse provoked investigation into the hospital, but were ultimately and repeatedly dismissed. Ray himself admits that the memoir sold well, but that, quote, people enjoyed it as a good joke, as something to while away the time of an idle evening or as a substitute for the circus. Uh, Hunt pulled people together in these uh, sort of speaking engagements and passed out his pamphlets there. And so that's just sort of the, the historical context for it. Isaac Ray has since gone down in history as a father of forensic psychology. But in the rare cases that Astounding Disclosures is recalled, it's remembered for its, quote, psychotic analogies or for its incohesive narrative, quote, impaired by Hunt's disability. This is language I've taken from, from two different ways that his narrative has been introduced in recent scholarship. <clears throat> I would argue, however, that Hunt's narrative is not flawed. 
Instead, it's this literary experimentation that represents how his sense of time, place, and self might have fluctuated during his stay in the hospital. It's true that he makes his reader feel disoriented by blurring truth and delusion, but it's precisely through this disorientation that he conveys what his experience of madness felt like and of the hospital itself. The accusations in Hunt's text may not have held up in court, but he was the first in a long line of patient writers in the US finding creative ways to capture madness and narrative. Hunt's memoir made it possible for the public to see into the newly private quarters of asylum patients, carefully taught the public how to stare at patients in a way that generates wonder, recognition, and familiarity rather than horror or objectification. New slide. While Hunt's text did not achieve the material and legal changes he might have hoped for, other asylum memoir expose writers borrowed his techniques and found much more success. So Elizabeth Parsons Ware Packard, the second one here, also gave her reader a tour around the asylum and introduced some to patients by name. After her release, Packard spent her life successfully advocating for women's rights in marriage so that no other wives would be incarcerated against their will as she was. Nellie Bly, the third one, uh, helped her reader make sense of where in the institutional hierarchy we should place the blame for neglect. She later claimed that 10 days in a madhouse inspired New York City to appropriate $1 million, quote, for the benefit of the insane. Clifford Beers, that fourth one, employed many of the same techniques as Hunt to narrate his own experiences of madness. Beers and his doctor later co-founded the National Committee for Mental Hygiene in 1901, which would later become Mental Health America. In an institutional system that had been recently remade into modern public-facing therapeutic centers, Memoir exposés like Packard's and Bly's offered these critical windows into the hidden back wards that challenged the claims of a utopian modern treatment. Memoirs like Isaac Hunt's and Clifford Beer's often an even more intimate view. They show the reader, to recall the words of the editor of the Opal, the heart, quote, withered by long and solitary indulgence in thoughts of the neglect and scorn of the world, which, rather real or imaginary, cannot be removed by sympathizing tones. While some of these passions may have had what the Opal called no reality for their object, like Hunt's claims of cannibalism, and some of these episodes might not line up with institutional documentation, memoirs like Hunt succeed in bringing to light the most hidden life of a patient, inciting readers to think and act differently towards those who are experiencing madness. Next slide. What does it mean to act differently based on what we can learn from asylum memoirs? And what might that look like in practice today? One model involves working with the narratives of psychiatric survivors to promote community healing. Two people who have done this work are Vanessa Jackson, author of In Our Own Voice, African-American Studies of Oppression, Survival, and Recovery in Mental Health Systems, and Pamina Yellowbird, author of Wild Indians, Native Perspectives on the Hiawatha Asylum for Insane Indians. Both of these texts came out in 2001 and are easily available on the internet. I would really recommend reading them. In 2000, Jackson and Yellowbird collaborated via email to develop a set of questions um, for people interested in collecting stories from psychiatric survivors. Their resulting essays emerge from separate cultures, but tell two different stories of endurance amid psychi psychiatry's white supremacist roots, but their shared methods provide models for building historical narratives that begin from a place of patient agency and promote community healing. Jackson grounds her method in what she calls testimonial therapy as it emerged from black churches and she works to heal on the community level. Yellowbird speaks directly to native survivors of asylums like Canton as she explains the intergenerational importance of telling stories. In the process of collecting survivor stories, Jackson explains that she likes to leave the interview unstructured and flexible so that participants can tell their stories in their own way. When Jackson does prompt an interviewee with questions, they're often open-ended and they center the survivor's experience. These questions include inquiries like, what is one thing you love about yourself? What helps you heal? And what, if any, impact did being African-American have on the manifestation of behaviors labeled as mental illness in your treatment? Drawing on traditional native healers practices, Yellowbird asks three similar magic questions that situate the survivor as the expert on their own experience and treatment. What happened to you? Uh, how does what happened to you affect you now? And what do you need to heal? Yellowbird further tells her reader that, quote, if you have a story of loss and pain to tell, contact your tribal social services department and be cautious when entering into a medical model that doesn't work for native people, such as clinical, purely psychological methods born of European cultures and values, end quote. 
In addition to directing her project to Black survivors and those currently experiencing mental illness, Jackson is also interested in how other survivors of color like her want to work in, mental, in the mental health profession, but want to do so in a way that is aware of psychiatry's roots and offers a healing practice that both addresses personal and communal experiences of trauma and mental illness. For these two writers, the very act of storytelling, of memoir crafting, is therapeutic as long as it, it centers the survivor's agency. While most of these survivors interviewed in their work did not have an outlet through which to speak publicly at the time of their experiences, Jackson and Yellowbird offer that ethical model for preserving and honoring these stories, just as 19th century memoirists did. New slide. So finally, as I promised, I wanna talk about my own work as a different kind of practitioner. I manage an emerging prison education program through a university, and my work involves administrative efforts to build the program, developing curricula to bring necessary and liberatory skills to incarcerated students, and working as a liaison between my university community and incarcerated students. In many ways, our current carceral system is a direct legacy of an asylum system. In, as of 2020, the three largest mental health facilities in the US for the LA County Jail, the Cook County Jail, and Rikers Island. There's a clear line from the emptying of asylums in the 1970s to the tough on crime legislation, legislation and prison boom of the 80s, 90s, and 2000s. There are lots of scholars who focus on the connection and we will hear from Ann Parsons in a little bit. Um, so hopefully that'll, that'll get fleshed out soon. Uh, but I can add that in my own work, I hear distinct echoes of asylum memoirists while I'm working with incarcerated writers and learners. There are material parallels. Elizabeth Parsons where Packard sewed her writing into handmade waistbands to mail to her daughter. It was a tactic that failed when it was intercepted by her superintendents. Um, but many of today's incarcerated writers and their instructors also work under great material constraints to access physical writing materials, communicate feedback on work, write candidly about issues pertinent to their lives and find routes to publish that work. There are also some ethical parallels. I find myself thinking about Isaac Hunt's careful humanization of his fellow patients when someone asks what it's like to work with incarcerated students, often looking for a spectacle of a story, or about that Opal writer who turned away visitors looking to see something grotesque. In a post-Bedlam era, stories are how the public interface with institutions like asylums and prisons. A careful look at the narrative strategies, the expertise, and the material reality of, of asylum memoirs has a lot to teach us about our cultural relationships to psychiatry, mental health, and institutionalization. Thank you. Thank you, Liana. Uh, next, I'd like to introduce Dr. Diana Martha Lewis, who will be speaking today about the Method in Her Madness, Harriet Tubman and 19th Century Conceptions of Insanity. Dr. Lewis is joining us remotely today and has provided a pre-recorded video of her talk, but she will be joining us live for the Q&A to follow. Dr. Lewis's research pursues the intersections of disability studies and critical race studies with respect to issues of mental illness in African-American life. Her current project, Colored Insane, Slavery, Asylums, and Mental Illness in 19th Century America, examines the impact of major transformations in both American psychiatry and African Americans social condition, the end of one of America's prototypical institutions of confinement and the expansion of another, slavery and asylums respectively. It tells the story of how 19th century psychiatric discourses made African Americans mad by both constructing disorders according to prevailing notions of race and insanity and inflicting real psychological harm within asylums, plantations, jails, and society writ large. Further, it shows how black intellectual thought on mental illness often challenged reigning psychiatric, psychiatric beliefs. Colored Insane reveals the multi-layered, ubiquitous and ongoing experiences of mental illness, both real and imagined, among 19th century African-Americans set the stage for black experiences with mental illness for generations to come. Dr. Lewis is beginning a second project that explores mental illness and psychiatry among blacks at 19th century asylums in other parts of the African diaspora including Black Rock Hospital in Barbados, West Indies, and Lutindi Hospital in Tanzania, East Africa. Thank you. Uh, 
I think this is that inevitable uh, <laughs> technology hiccup that I referenced earlier. Uh, please hang on for just a moment. Today's presentation consists of my preliminary examination of materials in a chapter from my manuscript, Colored Insane, Slavery, Asylums, and Mental Illness in the 19th Century. And what follows, I shed new light on often discussed aspects of Harriet Tubman's life, <clears throat> a disabling head injury, and her signature religiosity. I resituate both facets of her story in the historical and psychiatric milieu of her day, and then offer an alternative reading that Tubman embodied. Harriet Tubman, born Araminta Ross, never penned a narrative of her life, but every retelling of the heroine's story provides an account of the head injury she incurred in her early teenage years. Depictions usually illustrate that an overseer wounded Harriet while she was on an errand to Bucktown General Store. The overseer chased a field hand because the enslaved man left his post without permission. He hurled a two pound iron weight at the escaping man, but missed and instead struck Tubman. In lieu of medical treatment <clears throat> for her injury, she lay down for two days during which time she repeatedly went in and out of consciousness. After so, several gruesome weeks, the wound healed, but her body was forever changed. Tubman's slave master tried to sell her after the incident, but he was unable to find a buyer. Emma Padlock Telford writes in her biography of Tubman that as a result of the impairment, Tubman was not worth a sixpence to her master. Tubman's injuries would make her, quote, unsound. Soundness was a concept used by slave masters to consider the mental and physical health of enslaved people as a way to determine the potential value of their labor. Tubman's supposed unsoundness was lifelong. She endured decades of headaches, bouts of extreme fatigue, and sudden sleeping spells wherein she lost consciousness for several minutes. In many retellings, her head injury was accompanied by a host of spiritual gifts and supernatural abilities, <clears throat> including hearing the voice of God, forewarnings, dreams, visions, and out-of-body experiences. Among her visions, Tubman foresaw the commencement of the Civil War. When emancipation came, she was asked why she was not joyous. She admonished that she had already celebrated. She also had visions about John Brown and his demise before ever meeting him and had several premonitions of visitations from friends bearing monetary aid before they occurred. Those who knew her also believed that the injury awakened a vibrant spirituality that was reflected in, in her African-American religious practices characterized by wielding divine power, ecstatic singing, praying and shouting, and belief in the supernatural throughout her life. Keepers of Tubman's story have attempted to demystify the head injury and its aftermath by placing it within a biomedical framework. Focusing on the sleeping spells, Tubman's 20th century biographer, Earl Conrad, settled on a diagnosis of narcolepsy after communicating with several psychiatrists and physicians who speculated that her condition could be various mental illnesses, including hysteria, dementia precox, and schizophrenia. He believed that her supernatural experiences were linked to the head injury, but he refrained from including references to her religious expression in his biography. A self-proclaimed agnostic Jew, inspired by left-wing Marxist thought, <clears throat> 
He did not want Tubman's contributions to be sullied by mental illness or zealotness. He surmised, quote, the measurement of the woman must finally rest upon her deeds rather than her visions. Even when implored by Tubman's great niece to capture the ways Harriet Tubman was, quote, in touch with a mysterious central originating force, he insisted on the irrelevance of Tubman's cycle history. More recent historians have also tried to decipher the condition. Catherine Clinton embraced Conrad's narcolepsy diagnosis, especially because narcoleptics can, quote, suffer from hypnogantic hallucinations or vivid images that emerge at the onset of sleep. Although she was more skeptical about the, the linkages between her head injury and psychic abilities. Erica Armstrong Dunbar speculated, quote, though in the 1830s there was no fancy term to describe Araminta's condition, her grave head injury likely induced a form of epilepsy that was accompanied by seizures. Kate Clifton Larson identified the condition as temporal lobe epilepsy based on the overlap of, of symptoms Tubman's interlocutors described and present day descriptions of the disease, which is characterized by seizures, sleeping spells, bright lights, colorful auras, disembodied voices, states of tremendous anxiety and fear, alternating with exceptional hyperactivity and fearlessness, dreamlike trances while appearing to be conscious, followed by episodes of overwhelming and crippling fatigue. TLE would have satisfied Conrad because it distanced the condition from mental illness. It is identified first and foremost by its primary symptoms, such as sleeping episodes, and only includes as secondary those associated with psychosis. Epilepsy has been largely excised from categorizations of mental illness today, but in the 19th century, it fits, it fits squarely in the realm of what lay people and psychiatrists alike considered insanity. Many asylums had separate wards on hospital premises for patients with epilepsy. However, there was little in the way of shared definitions of it, or any mental illness for that matter, among psychiatrists. Nonetheless, on one point they all agreed, it did not have supernatural origins. In their new medical science, there was no place for divine visitation or demonic possession. <clears throat> As Norman Dane explains, mental illness for 19th century psychiatrists was, quote, a pathological brain condition that has psychological symptoms. The origin could be psychological or organic, but the pathology is somatic. Usurping mental illness from the provenance of the church did not lead to a total severance of, the, of religion from the treatment of mental illness. American psychiatrists were committed to an understanding of disease that located the origins and treatment of insanity in the realm of science and medicine, but they were not willing to completely part with the religious doctrine, doctrines that shaped the cultural and political life in the period. Of the period, most psychiatrists often incorporated religious instruction into their administration of the dominant psychiatric treatment model, the moral treatment. The undergirding principle of moral therapy was the notion that man could be restored to his natural God intended order and that that was being upended by any number of social vices, including intemperance to drugs and alcohol, masturbation, excessive study, or by physical changes that cause serious illnesses, fluctuations in normal bodily functions like constipation, diarrhea, and menstruation, poor diet, or blows to the head. <clears throat> While social vices and various elements laid waste to the body and subsequently the mind, mid 19th century psychiatrists believed that mental illness could be cured. The asylum offered the necessary corrective to disorder through a daily schedule in which eating, sleeping, and activities were routinized. Activities included amusements, therapeutic labor such as gardening and carpentry, and religious observances. Asylums had chapels and assigned chaplains, though psychiatrists had different ideas about what kinds of religion was acceptable. <clears throat> 
Field forming psychiatrist Penley Earl explained that true religion aided in mental stability while fanaticism overtook its adherents. Still, psychiatrists did not believe even fanatical religion was the root cause of insanity. For individuals with a predisposition toward insanity, it was a host of participating, precipitating factors that could lead to, the, to religious excitement, a term that was used both as a formal diagnostic category and descriptor for an individual's behavior. One of the most well-known psychiatric writings on insanity and religion was Amara Brigham's uh, 1835 book, Observations on the Influence of Religion Upon the Health and Physical Welfare of Mankind. In it, he warned that religious services caused increased mental activity, which had dangerous consequences. Quote, mental excitement, by increasing the, the momentum of blood to the brain causes insanity, epilepsy, and convulsions. He was especially concerned about the content of pamphlet, pamphlets because they promoted and perpetuated belief in the quote, marvelous, mysterious, and miraculous, such as the quote, fulfillment of the dreams of pious people and quote, immediate answers to prayers. He speculated that the fits and seizures of participants were clear evidence of the inherent excitability of their religious expression. John Minson Galt, who fashioned himself an expert on the care of the colored insane, believed that there was a correlation between religious enthusiasm and epilepsy. Quote, there is not a more common symptom of epileptic, epileptic insanity than an exaltation of the religious feelings. To judge Tubman's sanity, psychiatric authorities of her day would consider both the blow to her head and her animated religious expression. While there is no record of her being treated by a psychiatrist, Tubman's charis <clears throat> charismatic spirituality and its entanglements with insanity was a topic of interest to those well-versed in the psychiatric discourses of the day. One such person was Benjamin Franklin Benjamin Sanborn, a reformer, writer, and abolitionist who became close friends with Tubman. He embodied a bridge between the world of mental health care reform and anti-slavery efforts. He edited the memoir of Penley Earl and penned the first biographical sketch of Tubman in his anti-slavery newspaper, The Commonwealth. He also contributed to the first full-length biography of Tubman that was put together by, by Sarah Bradford, who, uh, which was based on several interviews she conducted. Bradford's scenes in the life of Ter Harriet Tubman contain several letters and testimonials from Tubman's friends and fellow activists, including Wendell Phillips, Frederick Douglass, and Garrett Smith. Among the documents appeared Sanborn's letter to Bradford in which he poetically aggrandized the mystical nature of Tubman. Quote, there is a whole region of the marvelous in her nature, which has manifested itself at times remarkably. Believing that the supernatural aspects of Tubman's life were critical to her story, he instructed that retelling, retellings of her life um, must include, quote, her dreams and visions, misgivings and forewarnings. Sanborn's familiarity with 19th century wow. discourses on insanity did not dissuade him from publicly amplifying the marvelous aspects of Tubman's story. Oh. <clears throat> Appealing to her audience's probable preoccupation with anthropological discourses on mental capacity, especially between races, Bradford tried to repackage Tubman's supernatural exhibitions as evidence of her superior superior mental aptitude. However, it is clear that she placed little stock in, stock in that argument. Bradford knew well the metrics of insanity by which Tubman's experiences and behavior would be judged. Thus, her final statement on the matter is both a resignation and a sidestep. There was a wild poetry in these descriptions, which seemed to border almost on inspiration but by many, they, may be, they might be characterized as the ravings of insanity. All that can be said is, however, 
if this woman is mad, if this woman is insane, there has been a wonderful method in her madness. Bradford leaves open the possibility of Tubman's madness. At the same time, her proclamation was subversive in that she, as a lay person, postulated that there is ground yet undiscovered and under, under, unappreciated in a white male dominated domain of insanity theorizing. Her declaration not only exposed the precarity of the observational and often idiosyncratic means by which insanity was determined, but it also positioned Tubman as someone in full command of herself and pursuits. Bradford's words did not shield Tubman from being associated with insanity. In fact, most retellings of Tubman's life, including those by Bradford, make reference to her perceived insanity or took special care to point out Tubman's exceptional sharp wit. While there is no shortage of claims about Tubman's sanity, which I could talk a little bit more about in the Q&A, we do know what, we do not know what she herself thought about insanity and its meaning in relationship to her behavior, illness, or core beliefs. Was there in fact a method to her madness? While Bradford's editorial hand is clearly at work in the biographies, especially the later ones, the power of Tubman's own voice cannot be underestimated. She was a skilled orator who had experienced narrating her life to, a lar to large anti-slavery audiences as late as the 1850s and in, in more, and in more intimate settings among the families of her Auburn friends into her elder years. Some stories are corroborated by the fact that Tubman told them repeatedly one such story about a fugitive named Joe gives us a glimpse into her conceptualizations of insanity. The story begins with a descriptor of how Joe was such an exceptionally obedient and valuable laborer that he was rented out extensively by his master. He became so essential to the renting slave owner that he was eventually purchased by him. His new master ordered that he be broken in through a beating. Joe reminded his master that he had never been a problem, but the master explained that the beating was necessary for establishing all of his slaves' as full submission. After quietly enduring the whipping, Joe resolved to run away along with a handful of others to Canada with Tubman in November of 1856. When the group arrived in New York, they were informed of uh, runaway slave ads describing members of the party. Among the advertisements, Joe's was the highest reward for capture, $1,500, which was more than three times the price of others in the party. While all the fugitives lived under the constant threat of recapture, especially in the aftermath of the 1850 Fugitive Slave Law, learning of the reward had a crippling emotional effect on Joe. Upon hearing the news, quote, his heart sank. While others sang and shouted as they journeyed closer and closer to the promised land, Joe, quote, sat silent and sad. The singing had up to then sustained Joe on the difficult journey, <clears throat> filled with constant risk of exposure. But this blatant reminder filled Joe with overwhelming dread, quote, he sang no more, he talked no more. He sat with his hand in his head, his head in his hand, and nobody could muse him or make him take any interest in anything. In her revised 1886 edition of Tubman's story, Harriet, the Moses of her people, Bradford gives more insight into Joe's distinct psychological response. Joe, she writes, was, quote, always thinking of the horrors that awaited him if recaptured. Adjoined to the prose representation of Joe's story, Tubman included lines of a spiritual that the slaves sang, the fugitive, sorry, the fugitive sang as they uh, traveled. Although it is not titled as such, 
The spiritual is the lyrical articulation of Joe's plight. The music is demonstrative of Tubman's sermon-like storytelling style that was based in 19th century African-American oral and religious traditions. Joe's song, like biblical Psalms, captured in three stanzas, both the personal narrative of the speaker and the psychological depth of their experience. In the first stanza, the speaker explained that they were on their way to Canada because they could no longer, quote, bear the sad effects of slavery. Like Joe, whose decision was to run after a vicious beating, despite his strenuous labor, the speaker laments working without reward and being forced to, quote, flee the lash. The second stanza chron chronicled the psychological challenges of the escape itself. The verses uncovered the unspoken dangers that advertisements signified. Behind every, every reward poster, the stanza revealed, were flesh-hungry captors. Quote, the hounds are being on my track, old master comes behind. At the end of the stanza, the speaker turned to the divine with a specific invocation. Quote, O righteous father, wilt thou not pity me and aid me on to Canada where all the slaves are free? The last stanza, stanza spoke of the promise of freedom inherent to the place at the end of their journey where they hoped to find a peaceful home and leave behind the life of bondage forever. In the narrative, none of the usual coping mechanisms, songs, community prayer were sufficient for Joe. Only freedom would do. At the news that he was free, Joe cried, sung, and shouted, quote, in thrilling tones, the words, quote, glory to God and Jesus too. Joe was transfixed in a celestial communion, quote, and he, and can we doubt that the strain was taken up by angel voices and that through the arches of heaven echoed and re-echoed the strain. Joe's singing was so loud that others in the party tried to quiet him. Joe's sorrow in the land of bondage was legible. It was a rational response to the turmoil they all faced. But this excess in expression and freedom was unsettling. One in the group, Peter, chastised, Joe, stop your hollering. Folks will think you're crazy. William made a similar plea. Joe, stop your noise. You act like a fool. Neither charge changed Joe's course. In that moment of exaltation that seemingly took him beyond the physical world, Joe's story melded with that of Harriet herself. She, like him, told of, spirit, of spiritual communion with a God who answered prayers directly. 19th century spectators, whether black or white, psychiatrist or layperson, viewed such immovable exaltations as the very stuff of the marvelous that jeopardized insanity. But to Tubman, these spiritual encounters were the method by which she and her passengers were protected and sustained on perilous journeys and safely delivered from bondage. Tubman, like Joe, was impervious to charges of insanity. Perhaps like Bradford, she conceded it as a foregone conclusion, or maybe she felt her energy was best placed elsewhere. Her attention to matters of insanity was not to publicly defend herself or quibble over theories of etiology, but rather it was to care for those who bore the label without adequate support. When the 19th century psychiatric project of curing insanity was in ruins, Tubman was gearing up for her quote, last great ambition to open an institution committed to caring for the most vulnerable in her community, including the deaf, blind, elderly, and insane. Thank you.
going to take uh, questions and, um, from both the in-person audience and the online audience. So we'll, we'll likely alternate uh, that. And this is important if you're asking a question in person, we have these little spaceship looking gizmos called huddle pods. We're gonna need to bring that to you. I will be bringing that around and you'll need to speak into it like a microphone um, to make that work. If the huddle pod is not in front of you, the folks who are online will not be able to hear you. Um, it does not magnify the voice for the in-person crowd, so I may repeat questions if, if needed. All right. Hi, Diana. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Um, I'd like to start by asking you both a bit about your, your research methods. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about how in working with different types of narratives, um, you, how, how that shaped your research and how you put those narratives in conversation with other documentation, um, like archival records and, and patient records. Sure, I can, I can begin if, if you don't mind, Diana. Um, sure. Can you all hear me okay? Excellent. Uh, so when I was working with memoirs, um, one of the things that drove my approach to them beyond a sort of literary reading of them was principles of disability justice, um, was the importance of centering these memoirs in our histories. Um, and that gets really complicated, as I was pointing out, with, with memoirs like Isaac Hunt's, where some of the, the claims, like claims of cannibalism, for example, um, run counter to the historical record, right? And so for me, what I was looking for is a, a method for seeing the truth in these memoirs, even when the, the accounting isn't what we would usually consider truthful. Um, so there, there was a truth to his memoir in how he experienced the hospital, right? It reflected truthfully his experience. And so that's what I was looking for in that narrative interpretation. Um, but I've also done a lot of work in, in archives with patient records. Um, and as I approach those, I also try to think about uh, a hospital record as a storytelling device also. So even though we're trained to see paperwork as a record of fact, it elicits certain stories from people. It asks questions for a reason, right? So just as I was approaching patient memoirs with this set of narrative questions, I was also approaching patient records with a, a very narrative focused set of questions. What story is this asking a person to tell when they fill out a form? Um, what is uh, excluded from that story? What's included in that <clears throat> story, et cetera. Thank you for that question. Um, it's a really important one because it does speak to um, the kind of methods that are necessary. I think I, when I first began this research, I started with a question. And my question was, what were Black women in particular's experiences of mental illness in the 19th century? And so even though I was trained I, uh, as a literary scholar, to answer that question, I had to kind of move beyond literary analysis. The first place that I went was to archival records, um, particularly patient records. My book focuses on uh, Georgia Lunatic Asylum. Um, and uh, it was the largest asylum in the South. And so I looked at patient records, but of course um, those patients were not speaking in the records. And Black women and African-Americans in general were not writing asylum narratives that, you know, the uh, Leanna, your talk was wonderful, by the way. Uh, but there was, of course, a large body of asylum narratives, but they didn't include Black voices at all. And so I had to say, well, where are Black people speaking? Because I'm not going to assume, as um, I think the history of psychiatry has, um, that like they were not talking and thinking about mental illness. And uh, what I found was, in fact, that they had a lot to say about mental health um, and about how the world they lived in impacted their bodies um, and in their minds. But I had to look to different kinds of sources. And so I, I looked at slave narratives, for example, which was the 
largest, uh, the dominant genre of African-American writing in the 19th century. And Black people are talking a lot about their experiences. Um, and then, of course, there are rare cases of Black people who are um, medically trained. So James McCune Smith, for example, was the first Black person to get a, a medical degree. He wrote back directly to psychiatrists at the time who were making claims about Black people's um, uh, proneness to insanity, particularly those uh, that were free. And then, and then I came across people like Harriet Tubman, who is a fascinating figure, not because she herself wrote narratives, but she did a lot of care for people with disabilities, people who were marginalized. So I looked at like, well, how were Black people caring for um, health in general, but mental health in particular? And so, you know, asking that question forced me to look in very unlikely places to answer it. Um, it's really hard work. I got all kind of gray hairs <laughs> from doing it. Um, but I think it is rewarding, not just because you get added perspectives, right? Like that you just like broaden what, you know, how many people are part of, con of the conversation, but because you get alternative perceptions about mental health, about how to like treat it. And so I think those alternative pers uh, perspectives offer also new information that we can use today to try to think about how the, you know, what the best ways of caring for people with disabilities in general and mental health issues in particular can be. So it just broadens our imagination for the present and for the future. Thank you. And we have a, a question in the audience here. Um, I just want to check, is this working for the Zoom audience to hear me? Great, excellent. So there you go. About this distance? That, that's probably <clears throat> yeah. uh, Yes, uh, Ed O'Donnell, I run a charity which helps the homeless, mentally ill. <laughs> There's about every other group of needy people. Are we giving, in the whole mental health field, <clears throat> far too little attention to the extent that physical factors, smoking, alcohol, drugs, uh, lack of sleep, poor physical fitness, uh, poor nutrition, you, you get the picture, can lead to mental illness? That's a great question. Thank you. Diana, do you want to go first? Oh, you could, you could go on writing notes. <laughs> okay. Okay. Uh, my, my first initial thoughts are, uh, that yes, I, I would agree that we are giving too little attention to this. And it, it is from the historical perspective, those environmental factors are something that people like Kirk Bryant thought a lot about, right? So it's something that's been part of the conversation for a very long time. The amount of sunlight people were getting, the amount of uh, you know, nutritional uh, access people had. Um, so, so again, those environmental factors, that sort of holistic view of mental health, that it involves every facet of your life. Um, these are all questions that I think have been part of the conversation for a long time, but um, especially when we, we start talking about more chemical and biological factors, sometimes we lose focus on the environmental factors and, and of the fact that mental health is a holistic thing, right? Um, and it is, it's also a question that comes up all the time in um, the the sort of circles I'm working in with currently incarcerated folks, the effects of isolation, for example, on mental health are just huge and it's massively impactful. Um, and so, so yes, I would agree completely that um, environmental factors are are a big part of the conversation and always have been. But sometimes we lose that focus when we start looking at a solely biological model of mental health. Okay, so I, I would agree um, that it's been a part of the conversation for a long time. Because if you look at like slave narrators, when they're talking about mental health, they are talking about all of those factors. Like they are talking about the ways in which enslaved people didn't have food. They're talking about physical beatings. They're talking about lack of sleep. Um, they're talking about other factors in terms of like being alienated from 
uh, families and communities. Um, and then I think also, again, looking at Tubman's home, part of what she uh, was providing was like a home space where people had their basic needs met. And so she, when people showed up at her doorstep, she didn't think that they should go to an asylum, even though she knew all about asylums, her closest friends were the leaders in the world of asylum keeping, but she felt like her home was like the best place for their care. So I do think that African-Americans have thought for a very long time about all of those other factors, um, along with things like spirituality. But um, I think, of course, addressing those issues means that something like, you know, medication alone isn't going to be the solution because that's not going to take care of a lot of these, I think, root causes for a lot of people. Of course, you know, I'm not a psychiatrist or a medical professional, but I do think that there needs to be more conversations between um, people who are trained in the humanities and people who are trained in medicine so that we can really like start to focus on how those, like how addressing those alternative sites of health conditions, like the emergence of health conditions um, play out with other processes in the body. So I, I you know, I agree um, that, that it's important to look at a lot of factors. I mean, smoking and alcoholism, alcoholism in particular came up as a huge concern in the uh, second half of the 19th century. I'm seeing it like all over black newspapers where they're talking about alcohol use as a big issue, but the psychiatrists are also thinking about that. Um, not in the way we think about it now that like alcoholism is a disease, but that it was like leading to insanity and that it was degenerative, that it was gonna be passed down and continue to like cause insanity. So that was a strong narrative, I think in the 19th century as well. Wonderful, so a question from our online audience. Um, I'm appreciating the connections between um, what Stephen Freed was talking about, about the history of psychiatry with the connections that you all are making in this presentation. And I'm wondering, how do we balance um, the demonstrated need for more funding for mental health institutions with uh, the importance of the historical and present day violence and uh, discrimination that these institutions can also perpetuate? Excellent question. I'm also taking notes here. So Diana, if you if you want to Yeah, I think I mean this is this is like a another tough issue because yes, absolutely we need more support for um for mental health issues like mental health treatment, but if all of that support is going into things like prisons, we do have to ask ourselves the question um about whether prisons are the best place to treat mental illness in the first place. And so um, it is a little bit, we, we have to learn from the past. It is, a, it, you know, large psychiatric institutions that became really custodial, really just housing large numbers of people. There, there was the same sort of spirit and effort and reform around pouring money and government support into those places. And we know that they were not good places to be. And so I feel like there's a similar kind of thing happening now. Yes, there's a lack of resources. Yes, they need more resources, but we gotta ask the larger question about how we're organizing our society and how we're imagining care. I think, of course, like, you know, during the Carter administration, when institutionalization kind of took a turn and turn, turned away from housing people in asylums, um, there was a little bit of hope there in terms of like community, creating community care that wasn't fully realized and supported um, financially. And so I think it, that doesn't mean that that model is not a good one, but I think it's something that we need to return to when we think about care, because part of the issue is that large facilities with one 
universal um, answer to care is not the answer, you know, and we, and we really do have to move away from that. And so, yeah, it's a conundrum to, um, we can say we need support, but if it's in the form, in the institutions that we have now, it's really not gonna be like good for the people who experience it, you know? So um, yeah, I just think we need to move away from the models that we have now, the dominant, forms of care that we have now. Yeah, I would, I would agree and add on to that. Um, this is a question I, I grapple with every day with my work in, in working with incarcerated students, because on one hand, while more funding would be great, uh, often we'll hear things like, oh, this is great. We can add on an educational wing. And my purpose here is not to make these institutions any bigger than they already are, right? Um, and the same goes for, for mental health care too. So while there are people who need care, the answer is not expanding these institutions, often carceral institutions that uh, don't actually get to the root of the problem. And so what I would suggest when we approach these questions is like Diana was suggesting, looking for radical solutions, looking at the root of the problem so that, you know, that. Latin root of the word radical, looking really for where did this problem start and how can we tackle that beginning of the problem? So it might be directing funding towards underfunded communities or education or something um, that is not adding on yet another mental health wing to a prison, for example. So um, while I think there are people who are currently incarcerated in these institutions who need care, and I, I think there's there's no reason to ignore that. I also think thinking about the root of the problem and how we can prevent people from being incarcerated and you know, accessing therapy for the first time while they're incarcerated, right? How can we get that to people before that happens? Um, I think looking for the roots of the problem, looking for more uh, preventative mental health care is uh, perhaps a, a better answer rather than expanding currently existing institutions. Well, thank you very much for, for sharing both of your uh, scholarship with us. It occurs to me that there probably some very interesting uh, relationships or similarities between the slave narratives and the asylum narratives. I don't know if anybody, any one scholar can absorb enough of both to really explore that. Uh, I have a question that really doesn't so much get at the, the deeper important issues that are being addressed at this conference, but I'm interested in and impressed by reading the excerpts that are available, how in a sense well-written they are, at least in terms of the ways of writing in the 19th century. And obviously if they, they were individuals who couldn't put words down, they, they wouldn't have the, the uh, memoirs, but, uh, and that also means that we don't have uh, the recollections of others who not necessarily being illiterate, but just weren't given to writing. So I wonder uh, whether, um, kind of lost a train also of where I was going with that, but um, how many of these, do we know how many of these asylum memoirs were written and a little bit more about who, who read them. And, oh, I, what I wanted to ask was in terms of the writing itself and the nature of these narratives, where do they fit in other uh, genres of writing in the 19th century? That's a lot of questions, but any, any of them that raise interest with either of you, uh, I'd be happy to hear about that. Jotting them down so I can remember all of them because they're really good questions. I'd actually like to, to add on to Stephen's question if I can and ask if there's any discernible difference in the public reception of narratives that were written by women versus those that were written by men. 
all very good questions. Uh, let me make sure I have that one down too. Okay, uh, I'd like to start just by sort of um, mentioning how much I think these asylum memoirs, which are primarily written by white patients who are educated and eventually get out of the asylum. I think all three of those things are very important to mention. Um, I think a lot of them take conventions from slave narratives um, and learn from slave narratives. So especially when they write about surveillance, uh, a lot of the, the literary techniques that these white memoirists use, I think were taken directly from slave narratives. So I think they, they learned often from from that genre um, and those writers. Uh, another, to, to your point about um, the fact that we only have access to certain ones and they're, they're really very well written, um, I think that that goes to the fact that, again, these are white educated people who have gotten out of the asylum. And so there's a lot of, in, in Packard's especially, she writes a lot about writing and then hiding it in her dress, sewing it into her dress. And so there's all these material constraints that writing can't get out of the asylum often. And so um, it was really, to, to the fact that we have some of these now, I think is attributable to the fact that they they got out and then published it. Um, so I'll, I have other two other questions too, but I'll throw it to Diana first and then come back well, to you. Well, to, to... Since you talked about similarities, maybe I could talk about a few differences. I I sort of um, had to to read uh, white women's narratives who and the, white women publish narratives more than there are more white women uh, asylum narratives than there are white men, so they were writing um, much more. Um, uh, but one of the things that I noticed right away were lots of comparisons that they made between themselves as like uh, insane people and um, slaves. So they would be like, they would, they would try to compare themselves to slaves. Of course, that's a kind of unsettling kind of comparison because black women who were in asylums, uh, especially you know, in the mid 19th century, right when they were allowed to, to to be admitted because they were not admitted until after slavery ended uh, in large numbers, uh, they were actually slaves. And so there is something going on uh, between uh, the ways that like white women are kind of deploying the language of being a slave that really uh, serves mm -hmm. to make invisible black women who had actual experiences of enslavement. Um, and I think there is like different kind of political work that slave narratives are doing um, as opposed to asylum narratives. Slave narratives were not written to kind of, the primary sort of focus was abolition. And so any of the arguments about the mental health of people in slavery was to kind of expose the kind of horrid nature of the institution. So there was for black people, a political argument that subsumed their kind of anti, like a, a, a lay anti-psychiatric -psych message. Because medicine, like all the other major institutions, um, was used to kind of support the system of slavery. They were using like medical arguments and psychiatric arguments to say that black people should be enslaved. So one of the conclusions was that there was less insanity amongst enslaved people because the idea was that uh, exposure to like advanced civilization was causing people to go insane. So they thought that people, you know, in Europe and in France were going insane because society was developing and enslaved people lived like a simple life. The same thing they felt about Indians, um, American Indians and about Africans in Africa. Um, not African Americans that they that they had less civilization and therefore less insanity, and and so they argued that when black people were not enslaved, that's when you saw insanity kind of grow out of control. So that was one of the arguments they were making, which of course was a political argument to maintain the system of slavery. And so I think um, slave narratives had as their like primary goal um, uh, abolition in the way that like asylum narratives were just, I think mostly trying to critique um, asylums and, and psychiatric narratives. And I, I agree with Leanna, 
um, kind of trying to change the perception of the people on the inside and the institutions. So it was a kind of counter uh, position to the asylum, the, the psychiatric authority of the day. Um, so anyway, I say all that to say <laughs> uh, that although there are like lots of ways that like all of those genres are mimicking each other because they're borrowing from earlier genres like confession narratives and memoirs and like religious tracts. There are other kinds of genres that slave narratives are borrowing from as well. Um, and so there's a lot of ways in which uh, expose writing that like those genres are, are speaking to the same audience who are looking for the same kind of thrilling inside peek at institutions that they're unfamiliar with. Um, but at the same time, some of the racial class tensions um, that are present in the day show up in the writing, in like asylum writing as well. So um, those are the things that kind of come first to mind when I think about that, those questions. Yeah, I'd also add if I can, the fact that these memoirs give a false sense of whiteness to these asylums, because we know from records that uh, by the end of the 19th century, black people were also at these asylums, but made to do the labor to keep the asylums running. Um, and so people like Elizabeth Parsons Ware Packard or um, the authors of the, the media are particularly interesting, the Alabama Insane Hospital newsletter, because you would think from reading it that the Alabama Insane Hospital was this utopia where people played the piano and recited poetry all the time. They're writing in the mid 1860s though, and it's in Alabama and there's no mention of the war. There's no mention of enslaved people. There's no mention of black patients. Um, and so this, this sort of falseness to the, the whiteness of the, the memoirs themselves is really interesting that they were trying to create this um, vision of, of a white asylum that is just not true. Um, but it, it may have been true from their experience because the housing units were so separate. Well, and I would say like, in terms of like the actual experiences in the asylum, you know, I found lots of evidence of how race enters the asylum. You know, there are patients white patients, for example, who say they have grandiose uh, visions of, of being um, harmed by black people. Um, and there are all kinds of racial tensions happening. There are like fights on the wards. Um, it's being recorded in the North and in the South. And so racial tensions are alive and well in the asylums, um, even if like some of the writings, even the psychiatric writings don't tr try to act like race is like not an issue, um, but it definitely is. We have an online question and then we're gonna take one more in-person question. I already saw a gentleman with his hand up and then we'll wrap it up. Okay. Wonderful, thank you. Um, this might be a question specifically for Diana, um, but I was really struck by what you were speaking about in terms of the uh, traditions of Black spirituality and the ways that those could be pathologized at times under um, the white gaze, which I think can also draw back to, or draws back to almost like the flip side of attention from an intersectional standpoint, which is, uh, that Stephen Fried was talking last night about how houses of worship um, are sometimes unwilling to structure more effective supports for uh, people with struggling with mental illness. Um, so I'm wondering if you could speak to how uh, those tensions could play, like how those tensions have shown up in your research and any perspective you have to offer on them in the modern day as well. Yeah, this is a really fascinating question, um, particularly for me as I, you know, just discovering, because one of the things that talking about, and I didn't do it in the talk, but thank you for the opportunity to talk about it, um, that I've discovered with Harriet Tubman is that her version of spirituality was one that, especially in the 19th century, really um, relied on like African derived understandings of the uh, supernatural world. And so partly when people, and it's not completely gone away, 
because it's still alive in certain sectors like kind of charismatic Pentecostal apostolic traditions. But um, when people were uh, exhibiting mental health like uh, symptoms that we would see and they would see as such, um, they black people often thought that somebody had put like a spell on them that they were being conjured and that the way to address the issue wasn't to like send them to an asylum or to send them to a doctor, but to a but to send them to a a root doctor or a conjure person, conjure doctor who could address the issue in the spiritual realm. And so they did use like herbs and um and charms, but they also did this kind of like spiritual intercession to correct the issue because they believed that insanity was really a signal, a sign of some other thing happening, not necessarily a condition in and of itself. And so what ended up happening was, you know, when people were sent to asylums, for example, and they were not cured because the moral treatment didn't, you know, wasn't working or they were, you know, for whatever, for lots of reasons, like the overcrowding and big institutions, um, you know, conjure doctors would say, of course it's not gonna work, but asylum's not gonna work because you didn't address the real issue. The real issue is a spiritual issue. And so, um, you know, I think what knowing about that history tells us is that like spirituality cannot and should not be ignored. We don't have really a place for that in modern medicine. Um, to think about spirituality. Okay, but then at the same time, you have in these spaces that they do consider insanity in connection to um, spirituality, language like um, what's happening to you is a demonic issue and you don't need medication, you don't need therapy. Um, you know, you see it in like contemporary black gospel um, music where it's like you need to be um you know they're going to cast out a spirit of depression or a spirit of anxiety right that like that is the only solution and you don't need any of these any of the like things that me modern medicine offers so i think what that tells us though is that we need to um think in more of a both and kind of way um i'm not saying i think we should not think about medicine or modern treat modern mental health treatments like therapy, for example. But I don't think we can necessarily ignore this spiritual component and that really there needs to be a way in which these things can be brought together in harmony um, and, uh, and not on either extreme. So not you need to be cured from a demon of depression um, or, you know, get laid, hands laid on you from a demon of depression, or on the other extreme, addressing your mental health issues can be completely divorced from your understanding of your spirituality, right? That there needs to be a bringing together of those worlds. And part of like what mental health, you know, part of, Leanna, when you were talking earlier about like supporting um, jails, I think that we might need to consider other kinds of institutions that serve communities like churches um, as places where there's mental health support. But if that is to happen, there needs to be a robust kind of conversation in which all of these different pieces can be brought together and, and can work in harmony. Because, you know, I like I said, I, don't, so I just don't think there's a one um, size fits all solution to mental health care. Um, but it can't be done with ignoring large parts of people's like senses of themselves and how they belong in the world. So um, I hope that answers your question or starts to answer your question uh, a little bit. So thank you. Um, I just wanted to go back to uh, earlier discussion about method. Uh, and I, I found your, your, both your answers to the, um, kind of the use of narratives or the value of, of narratives um, and how thinking about them in terms of um, 
trying to recapture the sub subjectivity of both you know, enslaved peoples as well as people who are in asylums. And, but you're both talking about written narratives and I was curious um, and, and you know, particularly with Diana, whether or not you um, or see WPA narratives, right, as a valuable source in trying to um, understand how uh, formerly enslaved people's kind of thought about mental uh, mental illness and mental health, and then whether or not uh, Leanna, or, or there are any kind of analogs um, uh, in uh, for again quote unquote mad people, right? Um, not that are producing narratives or um, that aren't written necessarily, right? There, there's, um, but you know that might be actually coming through kind of interviews or something like that. Yeah, I can I can start because it's a brief answer. Um, yes, and I'm particularly interested in textile art um, because patients very often had access to embroidery and sewing and quilting inside. And so, I mean, there's a quilt right outside there that that's really very expressive. But um, the Prinzhorn collection in Germany also has a number of pieces of textile art and embroidery from women patients in particular. Um, and so. This was a way for patients who didn't express themselves in selves in writing for whatever reason um, to be expressive. There was one patient in particular who uh, sewed a life-size man out of her bed sheets one night um, and then told the doctors that she needed to be moved out of her solitary cell because this man was threatening her and she needed to be with other patients. And so it was a way for, even though she didn't do it in writing, she used textiles to make change happen inside or to try to make change happen inside. Um, so that's that would be my answer. Uh, thank you for that question. Yes, I so most of what I just was talking about with the issues around conjuring um, came from WPA narratives. Uh, they're talking a lot and I mean, you know, WPA narratives, we have to remember where 19th, uh, 20th century sort of recollections, people who were, who were, a lot of them were children in slavery, um, thinking about slavery. And so uh, we kind of have to like take that into consideration, but I do get a lot of valuable information from them, not only WPA narratives, but also um, things like spirituals um, that were written down and um, also like folklore that was, told to people Harriet Tubman's narrative itself she you know she never wrote that was a you know a, it was it was more like WPA narratives in the sense that it was uh compiled from interviews just like WPA narratives that you know she had given to someone else um and then except for the fact that she wasn't a child and she had very vivid memories of slavery because she was an adult and it was written during the 19th century, um, not later, um, but absolutely, I kind of use anything I can get my hands on, you know, um, because it's just such a, a frag fragmented kind of history. But I really like the idea of other kinds of forms of art as expression, as things that we can read, um, because I do think language fails us a lot. Um, language, written language fails, uh, people in ex particularly in expression expressing um, their experiences of mental health issues and so I think now we have like all these tools of like you know art and music um, dance all of those things are places where issues can be worked out can be articulated and worked out so I think I wrote an article about that too um, about like dance and music uh, as forms of healing, um, but also as as ways to try to um, articulate people's experiences and understandings of mental illness. So I, I thank you for that question because it, you know, it just goes back to the fact that one form, particularly the written form, which has been um, glorified in our history uh, and your like European Eurocentric Western history as the dominant form of expression. Um, is just not the case for so many 
different groups and across time. So um, I do think it's important to, to look beyond the written. Okay, thank you, everybody. We're going to wrap up this session and take a break until we reconvene at 11.30. Now, if uh, you're following from home and you want a little more context on what we were just discussing, I would in particular highlight the sections of the online exhibition that deal with race and class and the section that is called More Than a Narrative, where we discuss some of the uh, topics that were just raised. Um, you can also take a look at them in-house if you are on site. So we'll see everybody back in this room uh, in about five minutes. Thank you.